We've spent two podcasts talking about starting pitchers, and we've only got through 37 names. So we've got a lot of work to do. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, February 23rd. Frank Stample joined by Scott White. Today on the show, it's starting pitcher preview part three. All of the starting pitchers, top prospects to know, deep sleepers, and, you know, some mid mid round names as well. I've got 21 pages of notes on the rundown, so we've got no time to waste. Scotty, let's jump right in, and we'll start where we left off yesterday. We got through Blake Snell as the 37th starting pitcher, and today we will pick things up at picks 129 through 140, rounds 11 and 12 in a 12-team league. Nick Lodolo at 128.5, who you expressed as a breakout yesterday. Freddie Peralta at 134, Lance Lynn at 136.6, and Jesus Lazardo at 140.4, who I am quite fond of myself. Scott, that leaves two names here that we haven't talked about yet. Freddie Peralta. The numbers were still good last year, but clearly limited to just 78 innings due to that uh, recurring shoulder injury that he's now dealt with multiple times throughout his career. Swinging strike rate took a big step back. Fastball velocity took a big step back. Um, where are you at on Freddie Peralta? Do you buy the bounce back or are you worried about that shoulder? At this price, I don't bounce by the bounce back like of, of this group Freddie Peralta is definitively my least favorite and look he could bounce back but it's it's the amount of risk you're taking for the cost and, and for the opportunity cost of drafting Freddie Peralta I, I don't think it's worth it my concern is that even when he was uh relatively healthy so he didn't go on the IL till late May of last year and yet he had one, uh, two starts of six innings. So his his you, you look at the game log beginning at the start of the season for Freddie Peralta. Four innings, three innings, five innings, six innings, five innings, five and two-thirds, seven innings, uh, three innings. IL comes back in August and his final uh, 10 appearances, he goes six innings twice. And he goes five innings, a total a total of four times, including those two six inning starts. So six of his ten starts after returning were less than five innings, and um, of his eight starts before getting hurt, three of them were less than five innings. So he was basically useless, even for the times he was healthy last season, because he was just too limited, partially by performance i mean and some of those starts were pretty ugly but the overall era was 358 so it wasn't even entirely that it was just the the brewers were primarily it was the brewers were so cautious with him um, and that was before that lat issue even popped up like i said so i just i don't know i mean obviously they let him go deeper into games in 2021 he had a great season i just don't really know how to explain what happened to Peralta last season. It doesn't appear that it was all about the shoulder. And that concerns me for the cost. One name here, Scott, who, well, frankly, I guess three names here that I'm targeting. Lodolo, Lazardo. again, we spoke about those yesterday. I like Lance Lynn a lot. If you look at the, just the surface numbers, 3.99 ERA, 1.13 whip. Okay, you see hey, he's 30, turning 36 years old. Yeah, he's probably done, right? Let's put his season into context a little bit. His first seven starts back last season, he was returning from a torn meniscus in his knee. He had a 7.5 ERA. Over Lance Lynn's final 14 starts, he had a 2.52 ERA, 0.97 whip, and a 14% swinging strike rate. Now, he only had 10 walks during that span, and that is something that I do, do not think is sustainable for Lance Lynn. Mm -hmm. But Scott, I think he still has it. In terms of like finding a pitcher this late in the draft that can give you volume, and pretty decent skills. I like it. I, I'm going to draft a lot of Lance Lynn. Yeah, I am too. I think he's being undervalued here. Um, I think, you know, understandably, if you just look at the 399 ERA, oh, this 35 year old, going to be 36 year old in May, he's on the decline, clearly. But as you point out, um, once he got going last season, he was as good as we had 
been used to seeing Lance Lynn over the previous few years. And he actually, in a, in a year when so many pitchers, so many high-end pitchers, failed to deliver their usual swinging strike rate, Lance Lenz was a career high. Yep. So stuff-wise, I don't think there are any concerns there. And the consistency issue, you could obviously blame on the time he missed to injury. So I, I think Lance Lynn is going to be very reliable, uh, pretty high-end pitcher for you. And somebody... Somebody I plan to have a lot of as somebody as as a person who doesn't intend to invest heavily in pitching. And I know you'll like this stat, Scott, of Lance Lynn's final 14 starts. 11 of those went six plus innings for Lynn. So, yeah, uh, boy, great on the workload there. Last point I'll make on Lazardo. I know I was talking him up yesterday and I still I love the skills, but I do have to point out the downside is that. <laughs> Uh, he's never thrown more than 124 in a third innings. And last year, he missed nearly three months with a strained left forearm. So that that is pretty worrisome for Lazardo. I, you know, I can't just overlook that. But when he was on the mound, he was really, really good. The next group is from picks 141 to 149. This is the round 12-13 range. Tony Gonsolin at 140.6. Chris Bassett at 144. Joe Ryan at 147.4. And Dustin May at 149.2. Uh, two names here that we spoke about yesterday. Gonsolin, I had as a bust. And Dustin May, I think we all kind of agree that he's going to be a breakout this season. Two names we didn't mention, Scott. Chris Bassett signed a three-year deal with the Blue Jays this offseason. And since the start of 2019, he's got a 3.31 ERA, 1.13 whip. Bassett has just been rock solid. Not crazy upside, but very safe floor. Uh, and then Joe Ryan... Strong rookie, I mean, I guess rookie season, 3.55 ERA, 1.10 whip, but the control was not as good as I thought, and he has this propensity to get blown up, Scott. I mean, we're talking extreme fly ball pitcher. There's a lot of those now, but he's like 53, 54%, so uh, I'm not really a Joe Ryan guy. What do you think about those two, Chris Bass and Joe Ryan? I mean, it depends how much of your pitching staff you've built by this point, but I do see myself as a Joe Ryan guy. Okay. He is very efficient. His walk rate, you're right, is a little higher than we expected it to be higher, much higher than it was in the minors. It was still less than three per nine, but you know, three per nine is getting pretty close to not being such a great walk rate. He threw 67 pitches percent of his pitches for strikes, so that's a good rate for Ryan, and I expect... I expect his walk rate to improve going forward. I think what he delivered, as far as that goes, was probably the 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 low point for him. Um, and what's most remarkable about Joe Ryan, and of course, this has been the case even going back to his minor league days, is that he mostly does it with the fastball. He has a slider. But he throws his fastball like two thirds of the time, and it's clearly his most effective pitch. Not a very hard thrower, but he he's got a nice release angle, good rising action on that fastball. It's very effective for what it is. He worked with drive line baseball this off season. I was reading over the weekend um, to improve his slider. It's a, I, I go as far as to call it a completely different slider, and develop a split to serve as his changeup. Now, I don't know how much he's going to back off the fastball. I don't know how much I want him to back on the fastball, back off the fastball since it is such a good pitch. But, you know, driveline baseball, it's a pretty smart program that has uh, led to some impressive things for other pitchers who've, who've uh, subjected themselves to it. And uh, I think it could allow Joe Ryan to take another step forward. Even as he is, I think he's fine here. ERA might be a little high because of some vulnerabilities to the long ball, but the strikeout rate is going to be solid. Because he's so efficient, he's going to give you a lot of those six-inning starts that I value so much. The whip is probably going to be low relative to the ERA. Uh, I, I think there's more upside here than somebody like Chris Bassett. But I'm also fine with Chris Bassett here just because he is such a stable innings eater, still with a contender going from the Mets now to the Blue Jays. Like, I, I think both of these pitchers, Ryan and Bassett, I'm going to have a fair amount of investment in. And I do want to say quickly, since I didn't get a chance to, to touch on Gonsolin yesterday, like I understand the bust argument for him and that I do think because of his injury history, there is true like bottom-out potential here. 
but weighing the risks against the rewards, I think his going rate is fine. I, I, I think a lot of the risk is already baked into the price for, for Tony Gonsolin. Um, you know, he had as many points, fantasy points per start, had points per start last year as, as Alec Manoa. And I don't know that he's going to have a 220 ERA again. I don't know that he's going to go 16 and one again. I mean, obviously that contributed to that, but he has been a very reliable source of ERA over his whole career. 251 ERA, a 0.99 whip for his career, about a strikeout per inning. And he still pitches for the Dodgers, who are like a slam dunk playoff team, even if they're not quite as strong as before. So I think Gonsolin is fine here. If we were drafting him according to last year's stats, it'd be a different story. But I'd be okay investing in him at this price. Yeah, I mean, you said it right, Scott. He's going to regress, Tony Gonsolin. He had a 2.14 ERA. I, that wouldn't surprise me if that jumps an entire run. Um, and some people might wonder, well, Frank, why do you like Lazardo and not Gonsolin? I mean, they're they're both pretty big injury risks. That's fair. But the skills for Lazardo are are actually better than Gonsolin. Gonsolin's really good. I get it. But in terms of yeah. like swinging strike rate, K minus walk rate, Lazardo was better. So that's, that's Gonsolin's awesome. difficult to evaluate because like he always blows out his ERA estimators. Like they yeah. they they make him seem worse than he is. But the the ERA has been very stable for him throughout his career. Not as not as good as two fourteen, but stable as in he delivers a low ERA. Yep. And I mean, that's just a Dodger specialty, right? <laughs> His Babbitt last year was 207. I mean, that is just, it sounds like it's completely unsustainable. It's 223 for his career. So he's maintained these low Babbitts. I, I don't know. As a right-handed pitcher, he is someone that strikes me as a as somebody who would uh, lose a little bit of value because of these you know shift restrictions, albeit still be, a, a valuable pitcher when he's on the mound, however long that is. The next group is going from picks 153 to 167, and that includes Lucas Giolito at 152.6, Pablo Lopez at 158.2, uh, Luis Garcia at 162.7. There's actually five names here. I had to squeeze Luis Garcia in because he didn't show <laughs> up on Fantasy Pros ADP. Uh, Chris Sale at 163.8, and Charlie Morton at 167.4. All right, Scott. This is a group I think we got to we got to slow down a little bit and, and kind of talk about because there is a lot going on here. Let's let's start with Giolito and Pablo Lopez. Just these two. Giolito, I mean, came crashing down to earth. 4.90 ERA, 1.44 whip, arguably the biggest bust among starting pitchers last season. But if you look at what he did before that, two two full seasons before last year, Giolito was the SP22 in 2021, he was the SP 13 in 2019. So he's shown that he could be a really valuable pitcher. And obviously Chris mentioned uh, yesterday that the weight is down for Giolito uh, back to the weight that he's played at in the past. The Pablo Lopez traded to the twins this off season. And I've referenced the, the home road splits. He's been much better in Marlins park in his career, but I don't worry about it as much target fields, a pretty good park to pitch in. And in, in general, the AL central is a good division to pitch in. I found something about a wrist injury that pro uh, popped up for Pablo Lopez last season on June 11th. Remember, it's right around there that his season kind of started to get derailed. His first 12 starts, 2.30 ERA, 9.2 K per nine. His final 20 starts, 4.68 ERA, 8.4 K per nine. So it wouldn't surprise me if maybe that's the reason, Scott. I mean, I don't know. He's probably always going to regress anyway. But I found it kind of interesting. What do you what do you think about these two? Do you find yourself drafting them? Gilito, Pablo Lopez. Well, I mean, I, I find myself drafting Chris Sale and, and Charlie Morton more. Right. So if if their ADP is lower, um, then I'm if 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 your draft plays out like ADP, then I'm not going to draft much of them. But not every draft does. I mean, particularly when you get far, this far down in the rankings, ADP is you know, you're going to see a lot of fluctuation from draft to draft um, around 30 picks or so relative to ADP. So it's very likely that Giolito and, and Lopez could last longer. I would say I'm a little more enthusiastic about Giolito. He's shown more upside. He was so bad last year that it, it's, it's a risk, but I, I, I kind of buy the explanation he's given for the weight gain 
and then the weight loss, you know, he added a lot of muscle thinking it would help him hold up better, thinking it might actually get it, create more power on his pitches. And what it really did was mess up his mechanics because I mean, when you, when you, when you change the makeup of your body, it's going to be hard to keep the same motion. Like, repeatability of delivery is a big step in pitcher development and anything that throws that off is of course going to throw you off. So I was most concerned even more than the performance, the fact that Giolito lost some velocity last year, but if there, if, if his delivery was out of whack, it makes sense. And he's done a lot of work to regain his delivery this off season. We'll see how he looks in spring training, of course, but I'm more optimistic than I was a month ago about Giolito and so if he slides a little beyond his ADP, there might come a point where I take him. I hadn't heard about this wrist injury for Pablo Lopez either. And so that might get me thinking about him more optimistically too. I don't know. You're kind of just breaking it to me right now. So I need to I stew over it a little more. It's on this uh, Pro Sports Transactions website that you sent me, Scott. So I just looked up yeah. to see if there was anything for Pablo Lopez and he was day to day with a wrist injury on June 11th. Okay, I feel like I heard that on a podcast somewhere else too. So, so this I, is you piecing the p piecing the puzzle together yourself rather than reading a report. Yeah, I'm trying. I gotcha. <laughs> I mean, maybe like when a player struggles and we don't have an explanation for him, usually the explanation is it's something physical we just never heard about. Uh, Unless he never comes out of the struggles, obviously, in which case we presume he, he just lost it. So ultimately, this season will tell uh, probably how valid your theory is for Pablo Lopez. But we have to decide right now whether or not we want to buy into it and buy into him. And I had been avoiding him. Uh, again, if, this isn't an alternate reality where Morton and Sale are already gone. But since that is still a very realistic reality, uh, there may come a point where I take Lopez just because he seems like the last innings eater who I feel confident will give me less than a four ERA. I feel confident Pablo Lopez will do that. I just think the, the strikeout rate will be whatever, and the ERA and whip, they'll, they'll all probably be whatever, but he'll give you a good number of innings per start for a team with playoff aspirations in Minnesota. And that, particularly if I've gone the cheap route at starting pitching, I may have a use for that. It's just going to be a little later in the draft than, than we currently are by ADP. The other three names, part of this group, Luis Garcia, who I mentioned, he's quietly just been solid. 3.72 ERA, 1.13 whip last year, right around a strikeout per inning. He races cutter usage, and it is a great pitch for him. 151 batting average against, 42.8% whiff rate, but... Luis Garcia kind of has this interesting uh, pitch motion and delivery where he's rocking back and forth. And so he's someone you worry about with the new pitch clock rules and they're cracking down on box. So keep that in mind. But good pitcher on a really good team, obviously, with Luis Garcia. And then the ones that you target most, got Chris Sale and Charlie Morton. You spoke about Sale yesterday. Uh, so talk me back into Charlie Morton and any other thoughts on Luis Garcia. <laughs> yeah, the reason I like Sale and Morton the most is because I think they have uh, I, I think they they still have legitimate ace upside, and I think they have very obvious explanations for what went wrong last year. Sale, especially, I mean, he would he had two non pitching related injuries. They shouldn't be an issue again because they weren't pitching related, and he's healthy now, and I think he'll be fine. But yeah, Morton's a, Morton's a more complicated case because he was basically healthy all of last season. We think and he was coming we back think, as far broken, as we know. He was coming back from the broken leg in the World Series the year prior. So he was still throwing plenty hard. He was still spinning that curveball at 3000 RPM, which is an amazing number of RPM if you don't know. So this presumption that he's just lost it, you know, you just look at the fact he's 39 and had a bad year, okay. But you dig a little deeper into the 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 individual stats like that and it doesn't seem to be the case like i have a harder time buying that's what went wrong for charlie morton last year what does stand out is that he gave up 28 home runs he had never given up more than 18 home runs in a season prior to last year 
when home runs went were way down across the league, that's when Charlie Morton totally blows out his his uh, his career high in home runs with 28. And even the ground ball rate itself was not nearly as high as we're used to seeing. He was actually a fly ball pitcher. Ground Chuck was a fly ball pitcher last year. And it doesn't really add up. I suspect there was probably a little something going on mechanically, something that was throwing off his location more than um, just his stuff being, you know, not crisp, not sharp anymore. And uh, I think I'll be able to correct that. I feel pretty confident in his ability to do so. So for the price, I, I don't think there's a lot of risk here with Charlie Morton. If it doesn't work out, you know, he's probably your fifth starting pitcher fourth if you're going really cheap like i like to do in a 12 team league and there's not a lot of risk for missing with that you know and with charlie morton for those who were not with us last year i am the curse i am the charlie morton curse because i invested heavily in charlie morton two years of my fantasy baseball playing career 2020 and 2022 he either sucked or was hurt in both of those years so I haven't drafted him yet. That means you should probably be drafting Charlie Morton because he's going to have a fantastic season. In all seriousness, Scott, something else that stood out to me was the control. 3.3 walks per nine, by far his highest since 2018. And I remember he would fall behind in counts so often, and then he would have to basically just lay one in there to, to throw strikes, and people were clobbering him. Like He was missing spots, and hitters were just teeing off on Charlie Morton. Now, maybe that's part of aging and he's kind of lost his command a little bit or maybe the leg was an issue so you can decide um if you want to kind of make do the glass half full or glass half empty but i think there is a real chance scott that if it was just age mm -hmm. there is a real chance that charlie morton is just gonna keep missing out on his spots and losing control and this is kind of where we're at now well it's a possibility. I can't rule it out. He is old and he is coming off a bad season. It was worst season in a very long time, excluding the, the weird 2020 season. Uh, but two more points about this. What I see digging into the data is more reminiscent of that Aaron Nola 2021 season that was also sus had a suspiciously high home run total. And we looked at all the numbers and thought, yeah, this guy's obviously going to bounce back. And he did. Seems a little reminiscent of that. The other thing, and I know this is a bit, a little bit fun with arbitrary endpoints, but just it does seem worth mentioning. Charlie Morton, remember in 2021, he got off to kind of a slow start and he, he took off mid season and ended up having the near ace performance that he did. Well, he didn't take off to quite the same extent in the middle of last season. But over his final 19 starts, Charlie Morton had a 363 ERA, a 110 whip, and 11.2 K per nine. Like that, if, if he just gives us that this year, then certainly he's going to be worth the ADP. I, I just remember how frustrating he was, though. I There was a stretch where he looked like he was back. There was like a one-month or six-week stretch. Charlie Morton looked like he was back. And then he just plummeted again. He ended the season really poorly as well. I, you know, I look at the underlying, like the FIP was 4.26. The XERA was 4.11. So you can, I think you can make both sides. To me, I, I'm kind of erring on the side of caution. Scotty's going back to the well with uh, Charlie Morton. Let's take a break. Before we do that, make sure to subscribe to our FBT newsletter. It's free. Just head to cbssports.com slash newsletters. Click on the FBT logo, punch in your email address, and that's it. And if you're looking for off-season fantasy football content, subscribe to the FFT newsletter to support our buddy, our host here, Chris Towers. If you listen to us on Spotify, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating there as well. We really appreciate it. Let's take a break. We'll be back right after this. Meanwhile, on Paramount Mountain. Okay, we have the northern face, the southern face, and... The Sylvester Stallone face. Stallone! Of course. Hey, how you doing? How you doing? Is that dad? Uh, yeah. No, 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 don't sneeze. Oh, dear God, no. Hold it. Hold it. Don't do it. Go. Ha! Gesundheit. Thank you. You're 
Let's get back into ADP, and we jump into the 170s, round 15 in a 12-team league. Jeffrey Springs with an ADP of 170.4. Jordan Montgomery at 177.8. Kodai Senga at 178.7. And Drew Rasmussen at 179.2. I think this is a pretty interesting group as well, Scott. We got the two Tampa Bay pitchers. Uh, I've talked about Springs all offseason. I do like him as a breakout. Drew Rasmussen. He broke out the year before in 2021, basically picked up right where he left off. He had a really strong season last year as well. And then we have Kodai Senga, who signed with the Mets over from Japan. Five years, $75 million. Great numbers. I personally have some question marks about uh, the injury concerns. He hasn't thrown more than 148 innings since 2019 over in Japan. Uh, And then Jordan Montgomery, who was traded to the Cardinals last year. It's a great organization. They do great work with their pitchers, really good defense behind him. And in 11 starts with the Cardinals, he had a 311 ERA and a 108 whip. So really, really good stuff for Jordan Montgomery. Uh, what, what do you think about this group, Scott? Anyone you target, avoid? What do you think? I don't end up drafting many of... I, I, I rarely have occasion to draft any of these four pitchers. I like Je- Jeffrey Springs and... Kodai Senga the best. I think they have the most upside. I don't see Jordan Montgomery or Drew Rasmussen getting much better than they were last year. I mean, Jordan Jordan Montgomery's kind of been stuck in neutral for a few years now, and um, Drew Rasmussen just doesn't have the strikeout ability of the others. So for me, it, it's it springs and and Senga that I could potentially get excited to draft. I feel like there's always somebody who's more excited to draft Springs than I am. And it's understandable. I mean, last year, 246 ERA, 107 whip, 9.6K per nine. I mean, who wouldn't want those numbers? The problem is that, as I pointed out, I think in part one, is kind of a glorified long reliever last year. He did have... Uh, let me see. Let me count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six inning starts. But he also had a lot of sub five inning starts. And I, I think typically fantasy baseball analysts are going to look at great ratios and say, okay, I'm willing to bet on the workload improving. And I'm less willing to bet that it's, it's been, I've kind of been, um, on a limb, out on a limb in that way for the past few years. Like I, I, I just think, given the way pitching and the approach to pitching has evolved, uh, has evolved in baseball over the last few years, you can't presume workload is going to improve, and you especially can't presume that for a pitcher on the Rays, who handle pitching as unconventionally as any organization, like to do use things like openers and and basically like to to have these multi-inning relievers that technically start. Springs is a little more than, I mean, he, like I said, he had a few six inning starts last year, so maybe he could become more than that, but maybe not. That's all I'm saying. And Kodai Senga, I mean, yeah, he had a great career in Japan. You're right. It was injury riddled. Uh, his walk rates weren't always the best also. And, you know, it's a, it's a big adjustment. It's the ball is a little different, a different feel. I think it's even a little bigger uh, in the majors versus Japan. Um, that's a lot to get used to on its own. But there's a lot of adjustments that come from going from that happen going from Japan to the majors, and you can't feel confident how any pitcher is going to make that transition. So it's it's a risk on top of just okay, what if he gets hurt? What if he walks too many guys? But clearly the upside is there for Sanga. I mean, he's he's his fastball's been clocked as high as 101 before. His, uh, his splitter is nicknamed the Ghost Fork. <laughs> and it seems like a wipeout pitch. And, and in Japan, when they were both pitching in Japan, it rated even better than Shohei Otani's splitter. And we see how good Otani's splitter is. 
So things could go really, really well for Senga. I suspect if they go really, really well, it'll be really well over 150 innings, not 180 innings. Yeah. So I don't really see like an ace outcome for him this year. But nobody's drafting him like that. So I think I think his ADP is fine. I'm interested to get him on a few of my teams. Just, you know, as as an SP5, right? Based on where he's going here, pick 180, that's realistic. You can get Kodai Senga as your SP5. So I don't want to undersell his upside. I feel like maybe when I introduced him, I kind of did some of that. I feel like the Mets fans are going to come for me. But there is a lot of upside with Kodai Senga. Uh, quite a bit of downside as well. So just keep that in mind. The ADP opens back up a little bit. Four names from... 182 to 208, so a bigger range here. Gr- uh, Grayson Rodriguez, arguably the top pitching prospect in baseball at 181.6. Brady Singer at 187.6. Lance McCullers, who was here at 192.8, but Lance McCullers suffered an arm injury, will not be ready for opening day. So instead, we're going to talk about Hunter Brown, baby. And then John Gray down at 208.2. Uh, let's start with the prospects here, Scott. Grayson Rodriguez, I mentioned, arguably the top prospect. He's a big dude, six foot five, two hundred twenty pounds. Only made seventeen starts last year due to a lat injury, but the minor league numbers are ridiculous. And there was a report last month that uh, Grayson Rodriguez should be in the Orioles' opening day rotation. The other prospect here mentioned the name Hunter Brown. Lance McCullers is out, Scott Brown. There's already been confirmation that, okay, it's time for him to step up. It looks like he's going to be in the Astros rotation. And this is the pitcher that emulates Justin Verlander's mechanics and delivery. There was a bunch of stories and video about it, and rightfully so. It's like a mirror image. Uh, Great numbers in the minors. Throws really hard. Has this wipeout curveball. And just 25 years old. So talk to me about these two, Grayson Rodriguez and Hunter Brown. Yeah, I would say Grayson Rodriguez is the best pitching prospect in baseball, and I would have called him that last year, too. I may have technically had Shane Boz ahead of him. It was 1-1-A, one one basically. And uh, in ways that I think go beyond just, oh, he's a really good pitching prospect, Grayson Rodriguez has everything you could want from a pitching prospect. Uh, a full arsenal of pitches that all rate very highly. Great command, great velocity, great size. It looks like he'll be able to take on innings um, as he develops. Like, and, and just how easily he handled the minor leagues. I don't feel like, I don't know. I've, I've said since the start that it reminded me of Jose Fernandez, just how easy he made it look as he climbed the ladder. It was a longer climb than Jose Fernandez had, so maybe that's not such a fair comparison but the point is Grayson Rodriguez has a ton of upside and should be great eventually I think inning per inning he'll be great this year but he never threw more than 103 innings in a minor league season he threw 75 and two-thirds last year with that lat issue so how much are they honestly going to let him go especially if he's going to be on the opening day roster uh, does, does that mean they're going to be a lot of short starts that aren't particularly useful for our purposes? That's the worst case scenario. A better scenario would be, do they pretty much use him like a conventional starter and then maybe option him down to the minors just to rest him for a few weeks around the all-star break before bringing him back for the stretch run? That would be preferable because for the time he's available, he could he should be really, really useful. But still you'll be without Grayson Rodriguez for a while if that happens. So it's, it's a, it's, it's less about my, my concern with drafting him is less about um, how good will he be, which is still a fair question since he's a rookie, but it's less about that than just how, how much use is he going to give you? And if, he is gone for a long time or he does have these four inning starts that drive you crazy. What have you given up instead? Because there's, there's still a lot of good pitchers being drafted in this range. So I I don't know that I draft a lot of Grayson Rodriguez because of that, but I'm not opposed to it in theory. Hunter Brown is a good pitching prospect. He's not Grayson Rodriguez level, but he's going to be on a really good Astros team. And initial returns last year were impressive. 
the story prior to his call up was that he had great stuff, Hunter Brown, but didn't know where it was going all the time. And you look at the minor league numbers, and I basically backed it up. He threw 62% of his pitches for strikes in the minors. It's a pretty bad rate. Came up to the majors, threw 67% of his pitches for strikes. It really wasn't a problem at all. Now, maybe it was a fluke, small sample size thing, but against tougher competition, even over a small sample size, you would expect that to get worse, not better. So maybe he figured something out. I mean, the Astros seemed pretty confident in him, basically awarding him Lance McCullough's spot without him really even having to earn it. Uh, so that's a good sign. And and I think the most important factor of all is that he's RP eligible. Yes. So we were talking in part one about how Spencer Strider, I was saying Spencer Strider is really the only spark worth caring about in head-to-head -head points leagues, uh, a starting pitcher you can slot in that relief pitcher spot. Well, now Hunter Brown is definitely one you need to care about too. So I was updating the rankings today, Scott, and I moved Hunter Brown. His ADP is 247. I moved him up to 175 in my rankings with the likelihood that he's starting in the Astros rotation. And that puts him around, you know, the, the previous group, Kodai Senga and those names. Is, does that sound okay to you? Hunter Brown around Kodai Senga and who else? That previous group, basically. So it was oh, like okay. Kodai Senga, Drew Rasmussen, basically. There. Just just for points leagues, you're saying? Uh, I moved them up in both formats to right around one okay. five. Yeah. I mean, it's a little higher than I'd want to go because because that moves them past Grayson Rodriguez in your rankings, right? I I got definitely yeah. rather have Rodriguez. I I think Brown's going to have his own workload concerns, and I don't think I'm not nearly as confident as in the performance as I am for Rodriguez. Uh, so I, I don't think I'll have him that high. Uh, let's see. Yeah. The, the most innings he threw in a minor league season was 106 last year. And yeah. then he got 20 more in the majors. So a little bit more than Rodriguez, but you know, they're, they're not just going to turn him loose for 180 innings. I feel pretty confident in that. And what if his control issues do return? Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't think I'd go that high on Hunter Brown, but certainly he's much more attractive than he was a day ago. I think what I'm learning is that I just have to raise Grayson Rodriguez in my rankings. I think uh, that's that's probably something I have to do. Because I agree. I'd, I'd rather have Grayson Rodriguez and Hunter Brown. Uh, two names here. I spoke about John Gray as a sleeper yesterday. Scott, I could get uh, some quick thoughts on him. And Brady Singer, who put it together last year. He pitched really well for the Royals. The control was much better. He gets a lot of ground balls. The slider improved tremendously. I don't really buy it, Scott, because the hard contact is still really high for Brady Singer. The swinging strike rate actually came down to 9.3% last year. So I acknowledge that he was very good and I appreciate it, but I don't trust it very much. So no, yeah, one, I don't see her. Yes. On John Gray. Yeah. Brady Singer. Like I, I kind of don't know what others see in him because, you know, most fantasy analysts, certainly the community as a whole, um, knows not to just look at surface numbers like ERA and whip, which were, you know, very good for singer last year, obviously, but a lot of the underlying numbers just aren't impressive and, and point to major regression coming. As you mentioned, Frank, I mean, he's basically just a two pitch pitcher and the fastball itself isn't that impressive. The slider isn't that impressive either. It's, it's, he made it work last year, but like you said, the swinging strike rate was very low. And to top it all off, he's he pitches for a terrible team that's not going to do him any favors if he isn't as incredible as he was last year. So I don't have a lot of interest in Singer in general, but certainly not at his price. Okay. We have four more pitchers going from 219 to 228. Jose Barrios at 218.8. Miles Michaelis at 222.8. Edward Cabrera at 226.4 and Sonny Gray at 228. Scott, there is not a single stat that I could point to last season that gives me optimism when it comes to Jose Barrios. The only thing I can refer to is the fact that his track record before last season was very good. He made yeah. 133 starts from 2017 to 2021 with a 3.74 ERA 1.17 whip and over a strikeout per inning. He turns 29 years old in May. I am not ready to say that Jose Barrios is done. So I think that I am going to target him just because of that track record. 
What are your thoughts on Jose Brios? Yeah, I basically feel the same way. I think the price tag makes it reasonable. And this is this is where it's very helpful that starting pitcher has become so much deeper because when we were all des- when we were so desperate for high end pitching during the juice ball era, um, a pitcher who had a good track record like Barrios, but was still young, the velocity still seemed fine. The following year, he'd kind of be drafted like that bad year never happened just because it was so hard to find a pitcher with that kind of upside, realistic upside. And this year, he's not being drafted close to that. I mean, a huge discount here for Barrios now. And if he doesn't bounce back, he'll be useless. I mean, you can't do much with a pitcher who has a 523 ERA and a 142 whip. But as I pointed out already, velocity seemed fine. Uh, for most of last year, uh, let me see. Did, could, did the walk rate seem good? Yeah, the walk rate was in line with with uh, his career norms. For most of last year, we were like, okay, Jose Barrios probably going to bounce back. Everything's so fine. It just didn't happen. So it... it it's very likely another one of those situations where something was just a little wrong with him that wasn't worth reporting on, or at least he didn't see it as worth mentioning. Um, and, and then he'll have, you know, if he starts to have a rebound season, maybe it'll come out what he was dealing with last year. And uh, it'll be like, oh, of course. Well, that, that explains it. And we shouldn't have, we should have never been down on him. I think for the price though, I'm in on Boreas too. Uh, I, I don't think the gap between him and Giolito deserves to be as big as it is. All right. Three other names here. Miles Michaelis had a great bounce back season last year. 329 ERA, 103 whip. Kind of reminds me of a pitcher, Scott, who can maybe suffer a little bit again with these new rules. The Cardinals typically do have a great defense uh, behind their pitchers, but a 249 Babip, that was a career best for Miles Michaelis. He had a 380 FIP, 389 XERA. So, uh, I am re- expecting regression for him. Uh, Edward Cabrera. I don't know how you feel about Edward Cabrera. I know Chris and I really like him, but you can share a few thoughts. And then the other name here was uh, Sonny Gray, who has not thrown more than 135 in a third inning since 2019. With that being said, he he was still pretty good when he pitched last year. So what do you think about those three? I like Cabrera in theory. It's just that there are a lot of pitchers that I like in theory right now, and I don't. I don't single him out the same way you and Chris do. And part of it's because I don't even know if he's going to have a rotation spot. I mean, Braxton Garrett was pretty good himself. I mean, he was better than Cabrera. Um, eh, I shouldn't say better. He was pretty good himself down the stretch last year. Garrett Braxton Garrett was good enough that he deserves a rotation spot. And it seems like they're going to... They're, they're only going to have room for one of these two, at least to begin the year. Obviously, they'll both get their chances at some point next year. But it, it doesn't seem like Cabrera has a job locked down already. And so uh, I tend to gravitate toward other pitchers drafted in the same range instead, or some drafted even later. Um, let's see. Who else? We've got uh, Miles Michaelis and Sonny Gray. Yeah. I'm just kind of over Sonny Gray. I know he had a 308 ERA last year, which is pretty good. A lot of the starts were short, and there was a lot of missed time to injury in between. And I just don't think the upside is there anymore to 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 deal with all the inconsistencies and all the all the issues that go with Sonny Gray. And I, I you know, I, I'm just not that interested anymore. I do like Miles Michaelis. So there's kind of a, I, I need to come up with a name for them, but there are three pitchers who last year came out of nowhere to be uh, rock solid fantasy options all season long. And they all three did it in an unconventional way. They weren't striking out a batter per inning. And I, I, I feel like they're kind of the, um, the, the poster childs of, of how you can succeed as a pitcher in the juice, juice ball era. One of them is Miles Michaelis, who's in this group. One of them is Merrill Kelly. And one of them goes a lot later, Martin Perez. 
Uh, well, and you could put Tyler Anderson in that group, I guess, as well. Maybe it's really a four. It's like a Mount Rushmore of pitchers <laughs> who figured out how to be good. Who, pitchers who've shown us that you don't need a big strikeout rate to have a good season outside of the juice ball era. I'm interested in all of them, basically because everybody seems to have written them off. Like they're, they're, They don't have any... They're not being drafted anywhere close to the way they performed last year. And as somebody who, um, as somebody who doesn't want to invest, be heavily invested in starting pitcher and wants to find these bargain pitchers, I, I feel like they they all fit into that category of okay, well, let's just if you pick up where you left off last year, you're going to be a great value for me. And so I I like Miles Michaelis in the same vein as as any of them. I don't know that he necessarily needs to go this much earlier than them. And in fact, I think Merrill Kelly is the one I target the highest of them. But uh, they're all bunched together in my rankings. And and I think it, we're, at, we're at a point here in ADP where it's kind of all garbled anyway. Like it's it, very few drafts are going to follow it this closely at this point. Mm -hmm. I think the, the point that you made there with if you want to draft those guys that performed well last year, but maybe the underlying skills don't support it. Similar to Jose Barrios, where they're going so late, even if they don't work out, all right, you can just drop these guys anyway. The problem is you are passing up on some guys who, I guess, you know, we say they have more upside. Like, I think someone like Eric Cabrera has more upside, but he's never done it before. So, um, you know. Yeah. Like, it's that's true. For inning upside, so. But what you have to remember is that like who who was who was targeting Martin Perez, Merrill Kelly, and uh, Miles Michaelis at this time last year? Nobody. Nobody. And because we're in a, 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 a at least unless they change the ball again, we're in a time when uh, pitching is plentiful. Like that's what's going to be emerging on the waiver wire in big numbers. So you take your best shot in the draft. And, and I, so I, I don't really feel like you have to sell out for the high risk, um, high risk, high reward. Yes. But such high risk that you don't, I, I don't know. I don't feel that confident that, that Edward, this is going to be the year Edward Cabrera puts it together. Maybe I'm just not as high on him as I should be, but that kind of pitcher, whether it's McKenzie Gore or, uh, Rowanzi Contreras or, or somebody like that. Oh, look at this upside this guy has. What's the chances of him making good on it? Maybe like 10%. Uh, I think I'd just rather take the guy who I feel closer to 50% confident is going to be that useful. And, um, you know, either way, if it doesn't work out, I'm going to have options on the waiver wire. Hey, maybe you take a mix, Scott. <laughs> mix and match. You take, uh, Maybe take one quote unquote boring guy like Miles Michaelis and and then uh, an upsidey guy like Mackenzie Gore, something like that. The next group from picks 229 to 240, Andrew Heaney with an ADP of 229.4, Patrick Sandoval at 233.6, Tyler Anderson at 238, and Jack Flaherty at 240. It's a pretty interesting group as well. I mean, Andrew Heaney, he had the Dodgers devil magic last year where he was awesome, has his new slider, throw, gets all these strikeouts, but he only did it over 72 and two thirds innings. So how sustainable is it really? Uh, Patrick Sandoval still gave you over a strikeout per inning. ERA was really good. Uh, he, he did that with a one, three, four whip. So can he get that down? Uh, Tyler Anderson, part of that group that you were just talking about, Scott, the, uh, the Mount Rushmore, what we're going with. And Jack Flaherty, someone I believe you've written up as a uh, as a sleeper. So talk to me about this group. Yeah, there's nothing specifically that appeals to me about Jack Flaherty except what he used to be. It's, it's kind of the same case for Jose Barrios. I came into my um, my rankings process this off season thinking, okay, enough with Jack Flaherty. And he, and he hasn't, but he hasn't been able to stay healthy in how long. And even when he has made these cameo appearances, he hasn't been very consistent. So I don't even know what to expect from him anymore. I, I just, you know, there, there's no reason to treat him like this uh, with this presumption that he's an ace. But then I came to find out 
nobody's treating him with that presumption anymore. So he's basically free, certainly from a 12 team context, in which case I see only upside because when he did uh, come back late last year, he, he came back in the middle of last season for three starts and looked terrible. Went back on the aisle with the same shoulder injury. When he came back, he looked much better. Like you saw glimpses of the old Jack Flaherty. I think it's still in there. He's certainly still young enough. Velocity seems fine and all of that. Uh, at least during that second stretch, it did. So I, I think we're writing him off a little too hard. When he's going after somebody like Edward Cabrera, I don't mean to keep picking on Cabrera, um, but when he's going after somebody like Sonny Gray, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Uh, Sandoval really let me down with the strikeout rate last year. Like he's he's not going to be good and get less he gets a lot of strikeouts. And with this changeup, he should get a lot of strikeouts. But the fact he didn't and still had his usual walk issues, his usual efficiency issues, it gets harder to get excited about him when he doesn't do the one thing that we know he that we thought we knew he would do well. Uh, let's see who else. Heaney. Oh, Heaney's a fun one because if you just Look at pitchers, pitchers who threw 50 innings last year, and you sort by swinging strike rate. All right, you got Edwin Diaz and Andres Munoz at the top, two stud relievers. Then you got Jacob DeGrom, who's an outlier among starting pitchers. Then you got a few more relievers. And 14th is Andrew Heaney. He was the second best starting pitcher behind only DeGrom and swinging strike rate last year. But the key is, 50 innings like i'm not like he's got to throw a lot more than that obviously to be useful can he i don't know i mean at this cost i'm not willing to bet that he can't but we're still in a range where like jack flaherty's going so it's just there's so much depth up and down the pitching rankings that it's I guess you have to pick your poison. You have to decide what's riskiest to you, what's most rewarding to you, and go from there. I just find that my preferences don't align so much with the guy who struggled to throw. Um, how many innings did he actually throw last year? Heaney? Yeah. 72 and two-thirds. 72 and two-thirds. A lot of them were like three and four inning stints too, right? Like Jeffrey Springs? Yeah, only two of four. So you know, I, I, it's, that's just that's just a profile I don't like investing in mm -hmm. because he could be really good and still be pretty useless just because he's not giving you the volume you need. Mm -hmm. So that's why I guess relative to some of the other names here, I'm not so excited about Heaney, but I certainly see the upside with what the Dodgers did with him last year. Heaney went on the IL twice last year with. Uh, either discomfort or inflammation in his left shoulder. And that's something he also went on the IL, IL with back in 2019. So this is a recurring injury. That's why I worry. Can he maintain the velocity and throw the slider this much without injuring his arm? And I tend to err on the side of eh, pessimism. I don't, I don't really know that he could do it. Uh, Tyler Anderson, the other name there, Scott spoke about him a little bit. Signed with the Angels this offseason, three years, $39 million. I don't think anyone is expecting him to come close to what he did with the Dodgers last year. But his FIP was 3.31. His XERA was 3.10. He had great control. And he did what pitchers should do. He leaned into his best pitch. He threw his changeup more. And it's a really, really good pitch. So that is the, the case for Tyler Anderson, who's going super late with an ADP of 238. Let's take one more break, and we'll be back right after this. Equality gets no timeouts or tryouts or second chances. February reminds us we can change our circumstances. We give thanks to the athletes who took big risks, who beat the odds despite being eyeballs because of their skin. But to change the status quo, you have to be willing when silence is comfortable. Speaking out is an act of resistance. This is the month we remember. But more importantly, we dream of something bigger. All right, let's talk some deep sleepers and prospects before we get back into ADP. Scott, let's help out some of those deep league players, 15-teamers, AL, NL only. Who are some names going outside of the top 300 in ADP that you are interested in? 
All right. Well, you wanted me to pick two, but I'm I'm going to rattle off several real quick. Okay. Let's make it quick. All right. So I like Bailey Ober of the Twins. And, you know, by virtue of these guys going outside the top 300, they're not all going to be guaranteed rotation spots. That's the case for Bailey Ober, who if Kenta Maeda comes back fine from Tommy John surgery, he's Ober's going to be on the outside looking in to begin the year. But of course, uh, no, no team gets through the year needing only five starting pitchers. Bailey Ober last year um, in 11 starts had a 321 ERA, 105 whip, 8.2 K per nine. Uh, not so much in terms of the pure stuff, but in terms of the kinds of batted ball results he gets, Bailey Ober reminds me a lot of Tristan McKenzie. I think he's, uh, with his fly ball heavy approach, he's got really good control. He's going to excel at limiting hits, which is not something we normally talk about in fantasy, but I think it, it I think maybe we need to start talking about it more because I think strikeouts are going to matter less for starting pitchers moving forward, which is part of the reason I like the the Merrill Kellys and Miles Michaelis of the world. All right. Um so Bailey Ober's one. I like whoever ends up coming out of the Atlanta fifth rotation battle, be it Mike Soroka or Ian Anderson or Bryce Elder. I think Elder has the least upside of the three, but I think whoever does win that spot will have legitimately earned it because he will have pitched that well. Uh, and, and Ian Anderson especially seems like one, myself included, that we've written off too quickly. I mean, how much, how highly, how high were we ranking this guy last year? And, uh, I was reading about the work he did on his mechanics. He had a whole bio biometric evaluation done and uh, he's worked on a slider to bring in a third pitch with that fastball and change up. That is so good. And I could just see things going really well for Ian Anderson this year, sort of like they did for Kyle Wright last year. I like whoever's going to come out of the rotation battle for the diamondbacks, be it Dre Jameson Ryan Nelson, both of whom we saw late last year, or Brandon Fott, who I think has more upside overall. Uh, Braxton Garrett, who I mentioned already last season, a very strong finish once he started emphasizing his slider more, which is his best pitch over his final final 12 starts. Braxton Garrett had a 302 ERA. So that's why I was saying, like, how can they leave that guy out of the rotation? We were very excited about Braxton Garrett as a waiver claim in the middle of last season, if you'll remember. I like Ken Waldachuk of the A's, who's kind of an unconventional, funky left-hander, had great strikeout numbers in the minors, and kind of a bumpy transition to the majors late last year, but started to show that strikeout ability over his last couple starts. Of course, he pitches for the A's, so what kind of win? Potential does he have? I like Cody Morris, who had terrific minor league numbers, just couldn't stay healthy, and he's already hurt this spring. So maybe it'll never happen for Cody Morris, but I like it in theory. And kind of a boring pitcher who, in deeper leagues, I see myself gravitating toward is Cole Irvin, who I think the Orioles specifically picked out because he's like the perfect prototype for their ballpark with its ridiculous left field. A left-handed fly ball pitcher uh, who, if, if he's not serving up home runs, tends to limit damage pretty well. Cole Irvin was great at home for the A's last year. He might even be better at home for the Orioles this year. Just wouldn't want to start him on the road. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, three names that I have here, two going just outside of the top 300. The first one is Noah Syndergaard. Just three names I'll give you. Tyler Anderson, Andrew Heaney, Tony Gonsolin. Look at the work that the Dodgers did with those three pitchers last year. Gonsolin's always been good, but he finally broke out last year. The Dodgers just find a way. I understand shift restrictions. Maybe it limits that team just a little bit more, but uh, I just trust the Dodgers will get the best out of Noah Syndergaard, and obviously it's a very low investment going outside the top 300. Apparently, they've already seen an uptick in Syndergaard's velocity this offseason. That was a report first couple yep. of days out of camp. Um, but it was coming around him too, Frankie. You might yeah. have more competition for yeah. Cindy Lou. Um, I don't know why I called him Cindy Lou. <laughs> Cindy who Cindergard. Rowanzi Contreras got you mentioned the name. You're out. I'm in, baby. 327 is the ADP. Uh, feels like the Pirates were just jerking him around all season last year. He still managed to put up 125 around 125 innings last season. So 
I think, okay, leave him up with the team now. Let's see him get his 150 and see what he could do with it. He returned for nine starts last season. ERA was a little bit high, 3.80. But I was really impressed by the swinging strike rate, 13% over those final nine starts. Really leaned into his slider. 42% usage over that span. That pitch has a 163 batting average against 42% whiff rate. So throw that slider a ton. I, th I think some good things could happen for Ronzi Contreras. And this name is really diva. <laughs> Outside the top 450 in ADP, this is a Nando Dofino special. Uh, we now co-manage a score sheet team together. Same league as you, Scott. Uh, and Nando likes Cody. Nando's like Cody Morris for years. The guy I just brought up. That was a Nando special too. Hey, we have Cody Morris as a minor league keeper. In this I know league. you do. So, yeah. uh, one name he texted me, he texted me the most obscure names. He said, Shintaro Fujinami. He's like, we're drafting this guy. <laughs> Signed with the A's this offseason, a one-year deal. Uh, turns 29 years old in April. Came over from Japan. And really interesting story. Went pro out of high school. He was drafted in the first round. Many considered him better than Otani. And for the first couple of years, Fujinami was crushing it. He was cruising as a starting pitcher. He was amazing. All of these strikeouts. Control just completely got off track. He just lost all of his control. Uh, they moved him to the bullpen. They even demoted him at times to their minor leagues in Japan. Uh, and then he bounced back last year. 2.77 ERA, 1.12 whip, over a strikeout per inning. The walks down to three per nine. Again, there's a really big transition phase. I get that. But once regarded as a phenom and had a very good season last year, pitching in a big ballpark, I'm kind of interested going that late. You know, AL only leagues, 15 team leagues. Shintaro Fujinami, that is the name there. Scott, let's talk about a few prospects. We already mentioned Grayson Rodriguez and Hunter Brown earlier on. Uh, let me throw like three each your way and I'll run through them because we still have a lot of other names to get to. Andrew Painter with the Phillies. Hayden Wesneski with the Cubs, Brian Bayo with the Red Sox. Obviously, Painter is like in a different stratosphere, but talk to me about those three. Yeah, I mean, Painter is, um, is he my second favorite pitching prospect? He might be my second favorite pitching prospect after Grayson Rodriguez. And of, of course, Grayson Rodriguez has a, has a big head start. Painter, what he did as a 19-year-old last year, making it all the way to double A, dominating at every stop amazing control, especially for a six foot seven guy. And it was so impressive that apparently he's in a rotation battle for the Phillies this spring. Be very aggressive. If he made the roster, Bailey falter was, you know, showed enough signs last year that I expect him to get the first crack at that, that fifth spot for the Phillies Bailey falter. But if Andrew painter does instead, that's going to be somebody who um, is going to be getting a lot of, a lot of traction all of a sudden in drafts. Uh, Hayden Wesneski was the other one you mentioned, right? Yep, and Brian Bayo. And Brian Bayo. Wesneski I, doesn't have great measurables, but the results have always been good. It's a little reminiscent of Kyle Hendricks that, in that way, and I bring that up on purpose because that's the rotation spot he'd be filling for the Cubs. Throws harder than Hendricks because everybody does, but Wesneski doesn't throw that hard. Good ground ball skills, good control skills. I could see him impressing as much as a non-strikeout pitcher can for the Cubs. Brian Bayo doesn't have an, a, a spot for the Red Sox, most likely if everybody's healthy, but um, good, really good ground ball skills. Uh, the measurables on the pitching, I mean, certainly as the velocity, and he improved. The overall numbers were bad once he got called up, but they got better over time. And it wouldn't surprise me if come May, he ends up being a pretty popular waiver wire pickup. Okay, the three Diamondbacks, Scott, you mentioned these names, Dre Jameson and Ryan Nelson. They made seven starts total last season at the end of the year, and both of them looked really impressive. So we'll see who emerges as the fifth starter, uh, Brandon Fott. I think we'll see him a little bit later on in the season. I could be wrong about that, but he led the minors with 218 strikeouts last season and actually got better at AAA mm -hmm. where that's in Reno, the PCL, where Dre Jamison and Ryan Nelson were awful. Brandon Fott mm -hmm. went there and he was amazing. So I think there, yeah. it reminds me a lot of Zach Gallen. You know, it's got yep. the year that he broke out and he was really good in the PCL. You just don't see pitchers do that at that level. So it's it's pretty interesting to me. 
I do like him quite a bit myself. Uh, a few other names here. I'll throw four your way, Scott. Kate Cavalli with the Nationals. Dio Hall with the Orioles. Apparently dealing with a, a back injury, but he was competing for a rotation spot himself. Kyle Muller came over to the A's in the Sean Murphy trade. And Kyle Harrison of the Giants. Big strikeouts, some control issues. I don't think he has a realistic shot on opening day, but he's probably someone we see in midseason. Yeah, I'm kind of out on DL Hall. There have just been no improvements in, in terms of him staying healthy and even more so bringing the walk rate down. Like, it's it's prohibitive. He, he can't be a starting pitcher uh, if he, if he can't doesn't learn to throw more strikes. And we've just seen no improvement from him in the minors. It's been the story for several years now. And then he can't stay healthy on top of it. So I, I, I think... Rel- a relief role is very likely in DL Hall's future, which of course isn't going to give him much value in fantasy. Could be wrong, but that's where I see it going at this point. Cade Cavalli appears to have a job locked up for the Nationals. He was a more highly regarded prospect heading into last year, I would say. Kind of struggled at AAA, but things got better um, the longer he was there. And uh, I, I still think there's upside. I just expect there to be some growing pains for Cade Cavalli. So for 2023 purposes, not that interested. And uh, who else was it? Kyle Muller. I do like Muller more than the consensus, I think. Big left-hander, a lot of spin on the fastball, good breaking ball, but has had some control issues, as many hard-throwing left-handers do. And now he's with the A's. So more opportunities, but not as uh, not as good of a situation in terms of support. Mm-hmm. And Kyle Harrison, Scott, anything on him? Oh, he's the best prospect of this group. Um, He's probably the best left-handed pitching prospect right now. Well, uh, yes. Ricky Tiet- Tiet- I, I pref- yeah, I prefer Ricky Tiedemann, but it's, it's between those two, Kyle Harrison and Ricky Tiedemann of the Blue Jays. I don't know. I I haven't heard much about his timeline. There's a good chance we see him at some point this year if he's pitching well at AAA and an opening develops in the Giants rotation. He has control problems of his own, but it's such a big bat misser. And, you know, the the control problems aren't as severe as like DL Hall's. So it's I don't think it's the same situation for Harrison. Last five prospects I have here, Scott. Three of the Dodgers, Gavin Stone, Bobby Miller, Ryan Pepio, and then two other really big name prospects. They're just really young. So I'm not sure that we're going to see them this year. Yuri Perez with the Marlins and Ricky Tiedemann, who we just mentioned with the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, do you see any of those five making an impact this year? A Yuri Perez and Ricky Tiedemann, like Andrew Painter, made it to double A as 19 year olds last year. It's such a rare thing to have to happen. And yet all three of them did it in the same year. You don't hear talk of Perez and Tiedemann getting called up this year. Unlike Painter though. So I, I agree. It's 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 more incredible to me that Painter's getting that chance at all than that Perez and Tiedemann won it. Uh, the Dodgers trio, definitely interesting. Stone, Miller, Pepio. Dodgers know what they're doing player development-wise, and it's going to be a great supporting cast. Because they signed Syndergaard, there's no longer an opening in the rotation. But there will be at some point this year. I suspect Pepio will get the first chance because he has already gotten his feet wet in the majors. But he has he has certainly has the lowest floor of the three because his control issues are pretty stark. I think Gavin Stone is my favorite of the three. He certainly put up the most impressive numbers last year. Bobby Miller's been talked about as a prospect for longer, but I buy I buy what Gavin Stone did last year. And uh, I think he could be a big deal in fantasy in a couple years. All right, let's wrap up here, Scotty, with some more ADP. See how many of these names we can get through. I'll just throw them towards you, and and you let me know if there's anyone you are adamant about or or targeting uh, in your drafts. Merrill Kelly, we already know that name. Reed Detmers, we spoke about him yesterday as well. Jose Arquiti and Aaron Ashby, who he's currently going at 263, but he's out until May with a shoulder issue, uh, issue, so... Obviously, yep. that will drop. And there's no guarantee he'll have a rotation spot. It, it looked like he was on the outside looking in even before the shoulder issue. So hard to get excited about Aaron Ashby right now. 
as much as we like the idea of him. As I mentioned, drafting a lot of Kelly this year um, was the 32nd best pitcher in Roto. I imagine was even higher than that in points leagues last year. Not being drafted anywhere close to that. He did get roughed up a little in September. It's worth noting. Uh, the home runs that had been down all year came back in September. So that that does give me a little bit of pause with Kelly. But I think... Th- Basically, he was the same pitcher that he's always been, just with fewer home runs, which makes sense in an environment where home runs aren't as easy to hit, that that's how it would translate. And the results ended up, the, the end result of that ended up being great for Kelly. Reed Demers, I talked about in breakouts. Yeah, I think he's already broken out. The, the only issue with him is he pitches for the Angels. So he's only going to start every sixth day instead of every fifth day. And that means few two start weeks. It's more of a head to head points point but it does uh it does diminish detmer's utility a bit Mm -hmm. one thing i noticed with merrill kelly is that he did increase his changeup usage last year and uh, i know there was some talk before uh the season that he was working on that changeup so it seemed to work out well for him i would say of your mount rushmore scott i like merrill kelly and tyler anderson the most of that group Next up, we have Ranger suarez cal quantrill alex cobb and martin perez i know you uh Mentioned Martin Perez as part of that group, the Mount Rushmore, but over his final 19 starts, he had a 1.37 whip, Scott. And yep. that sounds a lot like uh, the Martin Perez that we've uh, known over the years. I mean, he was still in successful in spite of that. In fact, I think, did his ERA go down even with all those walks? I, I think when I looked it up earlier, he still had a sub-3 ERA during that time. I don't know how. Yeah. That is what gives me pause. And I presume that's why he's so much lower um, than the others in terms of ADP. He has the biggest wart with that walk rate. I don't think it'll be as bad as it was as, it, as at its worst. I think probably, you know, you just look at the overall walk rate from Martin Perez, uh, BB per nine was 3.2. You know, it'll probably be somewhere between 3.2 and 3.5 next year. And the whip, will be a little high because of it. So he has the biggest wart, but he also probably is the most durable of them. And so I think specifically in points leagues, like there, there's points leagues versus Roto, probably a big gap in how you should value Martin Perez. I think he's undervalued either way, but it's easier to justify uh, reaching for him in points leagues because of that volume he provides. Yeah, I would say just as a a differentiation between the formats, Scott, you could tell me if I'm wrong. Head to head points, I think you want more innings eaters, accumulators. Ideally, you want both, right? Someone that gives you innings and gets a lot of strikeouts. Obviously, yeah. in roto and categories, we're paying a lot more attention to the category, uh, to ERA and whip and uh, yeah. strikeouts. We need strikeouts, but it doesn't matter as much in the CBS head to head point scoring format. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a good way to sum it up. In roto leagues and category leagues, you're pre- looking to preserve those ratios, ERA and whip. So a guy who gives you a lot of volume, if the ERA whip is too high, it's, it may not be worth it. But in a points league, you don't care about ERA and whip directly. I mean, yes, every hit, every walk, every run a pitcher gives up is a negative. But every inning is worth three points. So the volume... You know, those negatives uh, get washed out. And plus, they're all going into the same bucket. All statistical contributions go into the same bucket. So you don't have to preserve anything specifically. You just want a lot of points any way you can get them. And innings is, racking up innings is an easy way to rack up points. The next group, we see Nathan Avaldi, Trevor Rogers, Ross Tripling, and Jamison Tyone. Uh, you spoke about Rodgers as a sleeper. I spoke about Stripling yesterday, and Chris was highlighting Jamison Tyone. Any optimism on Nathan Avaldi, who signed with the Rangers this offseason? Yeah, I think his, I think he at his best, he's decidedly mid tier, and so I, I don't know that there needs to be a lot of enthusiasm for Nathan Avaldi. But we're to the point now where. 
you know, mid, a mid tier guy is pretty attractive. Like I, I don't feel like the floor is particularly low for Rivaldi either. So if you need some stability still for your rotation at this at this stage of the draft, um, he's somebody I would look toward. Certainly, there are some durability issues there. That was the main concern for him last year. But ERA is probably going to be south of four. The WHIP could be right around one two with about a strikeout per inning, and that's. That it, there will be stretches next year where Nathan Avaldi is worth using in every league. It's just a question of whether um, whether there's an enough upside to make him worth drafting in your particular league. Next up, we have Carlos Carrasco, Sean Manaya, who signed with the Giants this offseason, Michael Kopech, and Garrett Whitlock. I think all of them are kind of interesting, Scott. I mean, Carrasco seems like maybe he was a little bit unlucky last season. He's getting up there in age, obviously. I've seen some people make the sleeper case for Sean Manaya. It won't be me. Uh, Michael Kopech still has a lot of prospect pedigree. I know the underlying numbers were not great, but just a blind faith sleeper. I, I guess you can make the case for Kopech. And Garrett Whitlock, he has talent. We've seen that as a reliever. We have not seen it translate as a starter yet, which is the hope for the Boston Red Sox. Yeah, I get your point with Kopech and the price is so low. It's kind of like, why not? I mean, for for as much as he disappointed us with the strikeouts and everything last year, he had a 354 ERA. Yeah. But he does seem like a guy who, unless his velocity is incredible near Hunter Green level, the stuff just doesn't play that well and probably overachieved last year. And I just can't muster a lot of enthusiasm for him at this point. Maybe maybe it's because he's been in the fantasy discussion all the way back to 2018 when he first debuted, and then he was out with Tommy John surgery for a couple of years. So it, I, I might just be fatigued, and I'm you know, not assessing him. I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt the way I would uh, other pitchers who have so little track record. But... I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of out on Kopech. That's fair. Uh, anything else on this group, Scott? Carrasco, Manaya, Whitlock? The most exciting th thing I can say about any of them is Whitlock is RP eligible. <laughs> All right. So in points leagues, probably worth drafting late. Four more names. Adam Wainwright, Tyler Malley, Bailey Ober, and Eric Lauer. I do think Tyler Malley is kind of interesting, Scott. He's dealt with these shoulder injuries, which has really hampered him, but he has great career numbers outside of great American ballpark. And last year was traded to the twins. We might forget because he didn't really pitch much with them, but I'm kind of interested outside of Cincinnati with Tyler Malley. Yeah. And I mean, even with Cincinnati in, in 2021, it was great. He had 210 strikeouts. So it's not that long ago that we saw Mally deliver results we could all live with. So I agree. He's being undervalued. And, and in my own rankings, I moved him up quite a bit just last week. All right. Next up, we've got Marcus Stroman, Taiwan Walker, Andrew Painter, and Noah Syndergaard. Any love for the, uh, I don't even know. Can we call these guys accumulators, Marcus Stroman and Taiwan Walker? Walker... Yes, Strowman is sort of like Sonny Gray, where I expect he'll keep the ERA and whip pretty low. Not amazingly low, but pretty low. But the strikeouts won't be nothing to write home about. And and more, the bigger issue is just too many of those starts are going to be five innings or less. At least that was the case for Strowman last year with the Cubs. It was just a really hollow 350 ERA. Uh, Taiwan Walker, he took on more volume than that, but seems highly combustible to me. I just, yeah. I, I think it's, it wouldn't surprise me if he ends up being just as usable next year, but I don't see a lot of reason to invest in him except in really deep leagues. And the same goes for Jamison Tyone, who I know Chris talked up as a sleeper in part two of the, of the pitcher preview. But um, I, I kind of put him and Taiwan Walker in the same bucket where they may be reliably boring, but they won't 
be any better than that and they could be a lot worse. I guess the hope, which Chris pointed out, is that this new slider sweeper works out for Jamison Tyone. But without that, then you're probably right, Scott. There, he's it's, in that similar category. There have been years of dashed hopes with Jamison Tyone, and I just I don't buy it anymore. Oh, I, I don't. I know. As someone who has fallen for it many times. Names we haven't mentioned yet, Scott. I'll just throw four names at you. You tell me if you like any of these. Justin Steele, Kyle Bradish, Mackenzie Gore, and Tanner Houck. I think all four kind of have deep sleeper appeal. Yeah, it's kind of amazing the trajectory Mackenzie Gore's career has taken the past few years because he went into 2020 as the best pitching prospect in baseball. And then there were these kind of like rumors that in the alternate training site, remember they didn't have the minor league season in 2020. Um, Things kind of went awry for Mackenzie Gore. And then there's the 2021 season where minor league plays back and he just looks totally off. His velocity's down. His control's all over the place. His pl prospect stock plummets. And then last year, he comes back, has a great spring, makes the, the starting rotation for the Padres. And over his first eight, uh, first nine appearances, eight of them starts, taking us into June, Mackenzie Gore has a 150 ERA in the Padres rotation. And then the same issues pop up again. His velocity goes down. His control's all over the place. His ERA balloons. He winds up on the IL. He gets traded to the Nationals. We haven't seen him since. So his final ERA, even though it was 150 after nine appearances, it ended up being 450, and everybody seems to be out on him again. I think spring training is going to be awfully telling for McKenzie Gore, and maybe we'll, maybe we'll see his stock jump up again. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. I do want to mention Kyle Bradish too, because he is kind of a low, low key pitcher getting low key buzz. <laughs> and I'm not that excited about him personally, because by all the usual evaluation methods I use, I, there's just not a lot to see there. Not a lot of bat missing ability, not, not a lot of anything really. And in fact, some control problems on top of it all, but worth noting Kyle Bradish had a 276 ERA over his final uh, eight starts, less than a strikeout per inning, of course. And there were a couple starts in particular against he, the... He almost threw a complete game, right? Or he did? Eight, eight, and, two, eight and two thirds, two hit innings against the Astros. That's... And he also had eight two hit innings against the Astros earlier than that, too. That's crazy. And he had a seven inning, two hit start against the Red Sox. He had a seven inning two hit start against the guardians. I don't really understand it. My, all my sensibilities are telling me to sit are, are, you know, the red flags going up saying fluke, you know, don't buy into it. And so I'm, I'm listening to it. I'm listening to those instincts, but in six minor league starts last year, Kyle Bradish also had a one thirty ERA. So there may be something here that I just don't know how to evaluate. And, and so he's worth mentioning for that reason. But personally, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm high on Kyle Bradish. I just think he's a name to know. All right. Next group here, Braxton Garrett, who you spoke about earlier, Josiah Gray, Mike Clevenger, and Aaron Savali. I wrote up Savali in Sleepers 1.0, very deep sleeper. He made a pitch mix change last year. I know we've been talking about Savali for a while, uh, and he was much better down the stretch. So I'm still kind of interested in deeper leagues. Clevenger's dealing with a domestic violence situation. So we, we need to learn more. I don't know if he's going to miss any time with the White Sox. He signed with the White Sox this offseason, but kind of wait and see mode with, with him. Yep. Uh, Josiah Gray, is. I, I think he's the most interesting. He still shows some good swing and miss tendencies, just way too vulnerable to the long ball. He's got to figure out how to fix his fastball so that he's not getting crushed by home runs. Maybe he just needs to ditch the four-seamer for a sinker. But I do see a path for Josiah Gray to become a useful fantasy option. All right. Next up, we have Jose Quintana, David Peterson, Kenta Maeda, and Tyler McGill. Uh, Kenta Maeda, by the way, coming back from Tommy John surgery, which he had late in 2021. It's very similar to the timeline Justin Verlander had where 
he had his late in 2020, and then he was ready for the start of last season in 2022. So Maeda has had all the time in the world, Scott. Clearly not as successful as a Justin Verlander, but he had some pretty good fantasy seasons. So I'm interested to see what he could do uh, in his return. Yeah, I think he's undervalued. It could be another situation where um, he makes headlines this spring and suddenly Kinta Maeda is late round pick in every league. Wouldn't surprise me if that happened. Next up, Jose Suarez, Eduardo Rodriguez, Corey Kluber, and Domingo Herman, who will likely take the fifth starter job for the Yankees rotation now that Frankie Montas is out for, I don't know, maybe the year. There are some whispers about Clark Schmidt, but I think it will be Domingo Herman. I think so, too. And, you know, in an AL only sort of way, I have interest in Herman. Uh, I, I think Ho, uh, Jose Suarez has the most upside of this group. Um, some of his individual pitches have some very impressive metrics. Uh, I'm trying to find exactly which pitch I'm referring to. Uh, so the slider and change up both. And he had stretches where he was in pretty, pretty impressive last year. Again, he's part of that six man rotation for the angels. So I wonder if that'll limit his capacity to help you in fantasy, but Somebody to keep an eye on is Jose Suarez, I would say. Next up, Zach Eflin, Mike Soroka, Nick Pavetta, and Kyle Harrison, Giants prospect who we spoke about earlier. Zach Eflin, Scott, I don't really get it, but <laughs> if you want to buy into the narrative, Tampa Bay does not spend money. In fact, this was their biggest free agent signing in their history. They signed Zach Eflin to a three-year, $40 million deal. So I know he's got the big curveball. Maybe Tampa Bay will find a way to make it work. Yeah, that that was strange because no matter who Tampa Bay signs, you're going to be like, oh, they must see something in this guy. But they signed him, they signed Zach Eflin as if, as if they were a team signing him away from the Rays after the Rays already fixed him, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, they, they just paid Zach Eflin like they had already worked their magic on him. And so, yeah, it just didn't seem like a very cost efficient move. It ended up being kind of a wild off season for spending. So maybe they knew what they were doing all along. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think I like Zach Eflin more than most of the names we've done during this lightning round phase. Mm -hmm. If, if for no other reason, because he pitches for the Rays. but <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the XCRA was very low for him last year. And I'm trying to pull up exactly what it was, and my computer's not cooperating here. 3.27. Yeah. I mean, maybe. I mean, that for, for the cost, that's reason enough to get excited about Zach Eflin, right? Yeah. Yep. Uh, a couple other names. Actually, let's see what we got here. I'm just going to pick and choose, throw a bunch of away, Scott. If, if anything kind of excites you, just say the name. Steven Metz, Mitch Keller, Michael Waka, Alex Wood. Herman Marquez, Ken Waldachuk, you talked about, Ian Anderson, you talked about, Tarek Skubal. Skubal was really good last year. Looked like he was breaking out, but he's going to miss the first, I don't know, at least month, maybe a couple of months due to uh, an injury he's coming back from. Cody Morris, Cole Irvin, Johnny Cueto, Kyle Gibson. Anyone there, Scott, that I just mentioned? You know what? I think we talked about all the ones we're talking about. Boom! Starting pitcher. Done. <laughs> It only took us four and a half hours, but <laughs> we got it all covered, baby. Every year I say, we're going to be more efficient this time. We're going to be more efficient. Dude. There's just a lot of names, and there's a lot to talk about with each name. So I'm happy to go deep on these podcasts specifically because starting pitcher is uh, it's a very important position. We're going to wrap there. For Scott, I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye. <laughs>